Jazz Travels with Robbie Vincent. Jazz FM. Listening Colour.
Robbie Vincent with Jazz Travels. It's music, it's travel. That was Hugh Masekela bringing him back home, obviously about Nelson Mandela. And we start our South Africa season. My guest, I'm delighted to say, is Mike Vitti. And Mike was at the Cape Town Jazz Festival in South Africa for us. And Mike, I was there a few years ago, completely bowled over by the country. You were there even a few, few, few more years ago. Let's start with just an overview. Well, it's a very different place. I first I visited it in '98, and I uh, stayed with some family over there in Durban. And it was only four years after the end of apartheid, and it was a very complicated and confused place at the time. And I don't think people really quite knew where the country was going and what they expected out of it and what the future was going to be in the long term. And having gone there again just this year, some 12 years after, and seen how different the country is now, it's truly amazing. I mean, you know, you certainly sat in Cape Town wouldn't think that you're in Africa, that's for sure. That's the first thing that I think you notice. The infrastructure is fantastic um, and it really is a destination worth visiting because apart from the fact that it's so beautiful, actually it's just a stunning, stunning place which has got so many stories to tell and the great thing is now whereas before when I first visited everything was quite raw and very uncomfortable uh, people are willing to talk about the past now and they're starting to embrace it and move forward with it and I think I think that that's really encouraging and you can talk to people about it okay uh, I noticed how friendly people were when I went and in fact my guide was a former ANC fighter mm -hmm. who said in the bush he said we never washed we did allow ourselves to clean our teeth and wandering around with that story in my head as well, it was interesting how relaxed people were with mm. him. And this was a man who'd seen the real rough side of South African life. Now, we have to say everything is still imperfect, mm -hmm. as it is in most parts of the world. But lifting ourselves right out of that, what about the South African Jazz Festival, the sort of people that were there and some of your highlights that we'll be talking about in the future? Well, interestingly, actually, it's a predominantly black audience which visit the South African Jazz Festival and Cape Town itself is quite a white dominated city so the first thing you notice is how integrated things are and that's quite good and one of the th one of the things I think that surprised me the most actually I went to see Dave Coz in concert and he came out on stage and this guy's really switched on he walked out on the stage on his own blowing the South African national anthem on his saxophone and he blew the roof off the place and you know this cover version thing that he does of Garth Crooks the dance he started playing that and everybody in the audience was just singing and I thought that that actually was indicative of some of the change in the country over the last 18 years or so that this little white American guy from Los Angeles could come and stand on the stage and all of these people here would just be singing the words to a country song and I think that that tells a lot of stories and that was one of the things that I'll take away from that the other thing was Hugh Masekela, who we've just played now. I mean, he's just incredible. I've seen him before in the UK, but to see him in South Africa was just unbelievable. This amazing Zulu dance thing that he does, you know, and the, the whole crowd just go absolutely wild. And without a doubt, those are two of the, the major highlights for me. Uh, a couple of low lights as well, which we'll probably talk about, but, but that was, those are two of the major highlights. And of course, uh, in comparison to some of the African artists that we'll be visiting mm. in our uh, South Africa season, I mean, really, Dave Coz is as lightweight as you can get. Absolutely. And I'm interested to hear the sort of reaction that he gets for being switched on and understanding the audience. Well, I mean, Dave is a smart guy, you know, and... Um, and Very smart. We have conversations over email, you know, he's one of the, you drop him an email, he writes you back straight away, and I love that about him. And, um, and you know, he, he's very comfortable within the media, he knows how to sell himself, and he knows how to sell records. I know we've got uh, Third World coming... Remind me who was Paddy Austin? Patty Austin, James Ingram, Marcus Miller. Marcus Miller. Yeah. Uh, Marcus, of course, he's in town. He's in two towns, Manchester and London, this week. One of my favourites. And uh, let's have a Miller track. <laughs>
Brazilian rhyme, Marcus Miller. Bernard Wright plays on that, and that's one of the Queen's boys. You'll hear him talk about a little bit later on. Mike, you chatted to him. I did. I had a great time over there in South Africa talking to Marcus Miller about the shows that are coming up in London and Manchester this weekend, and the first thing I asked him about was whether he was excited or not to play. Yeah, very excited. We uh, are doing a tour with um, my new CD that I'm just finishing up now. The CD's called Renaissance, and uh, got a great band. And, uh, you know, we were in London a year ago, maybe a little more than a year ago, to do Tutu Revisited. And uh, that music was obviously music that I had written 25 years ago with some young musicians reinterpreting it. And I was so excited by the group that I, you know, thought maybe it would be nice to do a project where I wrote and arranged some music specifically for these guys as opposed to trying to retrofit what, what we had done 25 years ago with these new musicians. So now we have new music and I'm very excited to present what we've come up with. What's well, amazing is you, I, I remember you came, I was gutted because I couldn't be there at the time, but you came to the Jazz FM studios, you did a big interview with Robbie Vincent, mm -hmm. uh, which sounded amazing on the air, and you were excited though then about talking about Tutu, and a short while after that, so it must be about 18 months ago, maybe a little bit more, because I saw you play that gig at the North Sea Jazz Festival, okay. mm -hmm. uh, and I think, did you have Christian on, um, yes. on mm -hmm. trumpet then, and he yeah. was just unbelievable. Yeah, 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 you know, we... Um that, that Tutu Revisited was supposed to be one show, and I was talking about that a little earlier. It was supposed to be in connection with the Miles Davis exhibit in Paris, but people got wind of it, and uh, people were so excited to see it that we get it, it, you know, it extended. It was almost three years. It was two and a half years of, of um, playing that music, and it grew and evolved, and you know, uh, I think when we, by the time we hit the UK, we, were, we had pretty much hit our stride in terms of finding that balance between, you know, paying homage and also trying to create something new for today. Miles Davis, I don't think he would have been very happy if we, we stood on the stage and basically recreated something we had done in 1986. I think it was very important for us to find a new voice with which to present that music, and I think we did. When we, when we were in the UK, I think we were really really doing it exactly like I, I imagined it could be. You've worked with some amazing artists and what I find fascinating is um, your versatility because you can go from writing love songs with Luther Vandross mm -hmm. to creating Tutu with Miles Davis and going on stage and playing with Herbie Hancock. How many personalities has Marcus Miller actually got? <laughs> well you know I, I don't know for me I don't know if it's because I'm from New York but it's all the same thing for me you know it's just kind of accenting different aspects you know uh, with R&B, you, you uh, accent the rhythm and the sensuality sometimes, you know. With jazz, you might accent the harmony and improvisation, you know. With funk, you, you know, really kind of get that bass going, you know. But to me, you know, I think I started off in a very broad atmosphere, so it's a very natural thing for me. And, uh, and you grew up in Jamaica, Queens, didn't you? And that itself was a melting pot of talent, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Jamaica, Queens was amazing when I was coming up. I mean, uh, there's a guy, Donald Blackman, who was very important to us, you know, um, and Omar Hakim and Bernard Wright, uh, who was four years younger than me. Uh, we were kids, man. I mean, Bernard was 12, I was 16, you know, but we were going from club to club in New York, jamming and, and, and picking up influences. As a matter of fact, we're here in Cape Town, and I just ran into Hugh Masekela, who was one of the kind of godfathers in New York, even though he's a South African guy. By the time we were coming up, he was a fixture in New York, and we used to go jam on his gigs, you know, and he let us sit in, and he actually used a couple of us in his groups. So it is, it's an amazing, Jamaica, Queens is an amazing uh, atmosphere to grow in. I didn't realize how unique it was until I left, you know what I mean, and, and uh, started playing with these great musicians. And I'm going, this guy's good, but... I'm realizing, man, the guys that I grew up with in Jamaica, Queens, are just as good. I, I just happened to grow up with some of the greatest musicians in the world. You know, Tom Brown, you know, Bernard Wright, Lenny White, Billy Cobham. All these guys come from Jamaica, Queens. It's an amazing experience. Lenny White was quite outspoken yesterday, actually, in the press conference. Somebody had asked him a question about, um, about when he was going to be making more records and what he was going to be doing. And he said quite sharply, as soon as the record companies allow me to buy my work back. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, we're, we're definitely in a new era where musicians are starting to rethink that whole relationship. Um, it's really interesting to me because I think, um, you know, hip hop has really kind of um, changed the way people are looking at things. You know, up until then, if you're a black musician, man, you just basically look for a godfather, you know, a guy from a record company to come and say, look, you're my guy, you know, and, and basically make you into an artist. And now, you know, when the hip-hoppers came along and initially nobody was embracing that music, 
they figured out they had to do it themselves. And they became entrepreneurs, they became heads of record companies, you know. And uh, it made other musicians and other genres start to relook at things. And then you had the internet, you know, revolution, which further kind of urged you to control your own thing and to uh, be more uh, a master of your own destiny. So I think everybody's starting to relook at their situations. And your body of work is so vast. I mean, how do you... How do you control that yourself? I mean, are there elements of it that don't belong to you that you'd like to get back, for instance? No. Luckily for me, um, I never signed that paper that, uh, that the, uh, the big wigs put in front of you when you're young, you know? I think Paul McCartney might have signed that paper, uh, and I'm sure he regretted it, you know? But uh, a guy did put a piece of paper in front of me once, but I never, uh, I never signed it. So fortunately, I own my songs. And I, I own, you know, uh, my album, so I'm in good shape. OK, we have more from Marcus Miller in just a moment, and we'll be introducing one of the many great artists he's worked with. Oh, 
Robbie Vincent with Jazz Travels, Power of Love, Luther Vandross, co-written by Marcus Miller and was the 1991 R&B Song of the Year. My guest is Mike Vitti. Mike was at the South Africa Jazz Festival. You talked to Marcus about Luther, didn't you, Mike? I did talk to him about Luther Vandross, I mean, because Luther is one of my great passions in life and I was really keen to find out how the relationship went between the two of them because they worked so closely together right in the early days as well. And it's a big year for Luther this year. It was his 61st birthday a few weeks ago and, uh, you know, he'll have been dead six years in July, so it's quite a sad year, to be honest, as well. And I asked Marcus Miller if he missed working with him. Yeah, yeah, miss Luther really bad. And matter of fact, I'm trying to put together a tribute to him, but I want it to be a proper tribute, you know, not just kind of play his songs in a half-ass kind of way. You know, I'd rather really put some thought into it. And, and do it right, you know, something that he would be proud of. Well, the musicians are fine, that's okay. You can pull a, a group of musicians together that can play that more mm -hmm. than capably and quite brilliantly. Mm -hmm. um, his faithful backing singers that were always within, Lisa and Kevin and all of those, I'm sure they'd all come out to play. Mm -hmm. But how do you find a voice? Well, I think the thing to do is not try to find a voice. I think you'd be making a big mistake if you got there and tried to find a Luther Vandross sound alike to make the centerpiece of, of this tribute. Although, I got to admit, I have run into a couple of guys who've given me chills because they sound so close to Luther, but I don't think that should be the focus of it. I think it should be just the spirit and get people who do what they do as honestly and sincerely as Luther did what he did. I think it would be better to do it that way. It was an interesting album came out a couple of years ago, All Star Tribute thing, which had got Mary Jo Blige on it, doing Never Too Much, and various other contemporary artists, which was okay, but I don't think it quite captured that spirit that I think everybody was craving at the time, you know? Yeah, I think you really, uh, you have to do it carefully. I think it's important if you kind of understood Luther. A lot of people don't understand Luther. I remember some record company uh, said, Luther, man, we know exactly what we need to do to make you an even bigger star than you are. You know, we'll just have you do all cover songs. That's, that's what people love about you anyway, you know. And they thought it was as easy as just finding some popular old songs and having Luther re-sing them. And it was so much deeper than that. I mean, he took so much time and care in choosing the songs that he would actually cover if it wasn't a song he wrote, you know. He, he, done, he didn't just do songs just because they happened to be popular back in the day. He, he did songs that he really connected to and he thought he could bring something fresh to. And I think that's the kind of at, uh, attitude you have to have if you do a tribute to him. I think uh, I saw him in an interview once, I can't remember who it was with now, and he said actually, because they asked the question about the cover versions, because they were so unique, he made them in such a way that they almost could have been his, and the term he used would Lutherize them. I've Lutherized these mm -hmm. songs. Yeah, he would, he would absolutely Lutherize them, and they were songs that you wouldn't even consider to do. He did a song by the Carpenters, you know what I mean? He, he was considering doing songs by Elton John. It wasn't, it wasn't like he was going to do, you know, Al Green or Teddy Pendergrass or guys who were kind of in his genre uh, just before him. He looked all over for his inspiration, and uh, I don't think everybody can do that. So you're doing two shows in the U.K., and we're very excited about that. I'm excited to see this young new band that you've got with you as well. Um, will that uh, contain any of the elements of Tutu as well as some of the new stuff? Are you going to mix it up a bit? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I'm excited, to, like I said, to present this new music, but, uh, you know, it's, just, it's basically the same band from Tutu, so we'll be uh, probably touching on that as well.
The thing that we try to do uh, as musicians, especially if we have any kind of jazz mentality, is you try to find something different. You try to find something that, that doesn't exist yet. And at the time, in 1985-86, the idea of putting a, a jazz icon together with technology was very new. And uh, it was different, and uh, we were excited about that. Nowadays, there's nothing really uh, new about technology. And uh, to me, if I were to uh, get a call from Miles Davis today, I think my reaction would be to go completely the other direction and not turn any machines on at all, you know, and just kind of do it as naturally as possible because I think that's the thing that's going to set people apart these days. You know, uh, with GarageBand and, and all these computers, it's really easy for people to put music together on a real fundamental level and have it sound pretty cool. Uh, but there's a whole nother level, you know, when you get to the stage, you know, you got all these acts who can make nice sounding records and they get to the stage and people are like, oh man, that don't sound right, you know. So uh, I think the thing now for real musicians is to make sure that we uh, show people what real musicianship is all about and, and not rely on the machines so much. That's, of course, 2-2 Miles Davis, written by Marcus Miller on the album that he produced. And I remember asking him some time ago, I said, well, weren't you a bit worried when people didn't like the album? He said, no, we were really, really pleased because it was a whole new direction and they hoped very much they would, in a way, ruffle the feathers of original fans. Now, after the break, we've got the exclusive preview of the forthcoming album from Marcus Miller. And, of course, you have an opportunity to see a real musician in full effect Friday at the Royal Festival Hall in London and the Manchester Ritz on Sunday. If you would like to see the dictionary definition of a real musician, you'll see it there. After the break, not just an exclusive preview of Marcus Miller's new album, but we'll be meeting Alfredo Rodriguez. He completely disagrees with Marcus, you know, about technology. He's a very talented keyboard player and he's probably got the right to do that. We'll be meeting him after the break. <laughs> FM.
That's Detroit, Marcus Miller, an exclusive preview of his forthcoming album. My guest is Mike Vitti. It's our South Africa season. Mike was at the South African Jazz Festival. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at South Africa, hearing some great African music as well that we normally wouldn't have access to. And, you know, one of the really interesting people that Mike met was a guy called Alfredo Rodriguez. Tell us about him, Mike. He's an interesting guy, this guy. He's 26, and he has defected from Cuba. And I got chatting to him about Cuba and his life there because he, uh, he, I think, knew at a very early age he wanted to be a keyboard player and then a pianist and decided he couldn't do that under the current regime in Cuba. So he left his family and went to live in Los Angeles and now he can't go back. And I think at some point we'll probably hear about him speaking about Cuba and how he'd love to go back but he can't just at the moment and how he's afraid of westernization and, and how the country may, may well change in the future. But What's interesting about this guy is he's a really talented keyboard player and he plays straight ahead jazz with some Latin fusions and Quincy Jones has come out of retirement. This is the first album, the first solo artist album that Quincy Jones has produced since Michael Jackson's Bad. So that tells you how good this guy is, you know, and uh, just the week before we went I was trying to set up the interview with Alfredo and I got a letter off Quincy Jones and it's really quite an interesting one, albeit one that was sent to various different people around the world, but I actually did get get one that says dear colleague on it which i'm going to put in a frame and stick in the house does that mean you might be in quincy's band so? i'd love to be in quincy's band wouldn't that just be I'll brilliant see what I can do for you. <laughs> but but the fact is i mean you know to have somebody supremely talented like this guy and have quincy jones come out of retirement just to produce this album i think is really quite special so when i started talking to him the first question i had to ask him was how he met quincy jones well i i met mr jones uh six years ago at the Montoya Festival, and uh, I was there doing a concert. I was selected between 12 piano in the world to play there, and Quincy was there, and I did you know, one performance for Mr. Jones. And after that, uh, Quincy told me that I was very interesting, that he was very interesting in, in doing something together with me. Um, because I am from Cuba, from Havana, Cuba, I, I went back to Cuba, and because of you know, the political relation between the United States and Cuba, at that time were really bad. At that time it was completely impossible to do something together with, with Quincy. So uh, I decided in 2009, in January 2009, uh, in order to come, you know, in order to work with Mr. Jones to come to United States and, and I defected from Cuba to United States. So uh, since 2009 I am living in United States in, yeah. Well, Mike, what about this technology thing? Did Alfredo have anything to say about that? It's really interesting because the guy's clearly very talented. And about five or six minutes ago, we heard Marcus Miller say that if he was going to record again now in Miles Davis, he'd forget the technology and strip everything right back. What Alfredo Rodriguez is doing, bearing in mind he's produced by Quincy Jones, is saying completely the opposite. He'd like to embrace technology and take the music forward that way. Because I asked him about how jazz was going to move forward and whether he thought it was elitist or whether he thought it was sounding old or whether he thought it was just a bit crusty. I am living today, I was born 20-something years ago, so I am, I am living a different different moment. And uh, I do really think like technology is the only way that we are going to make this world happen in, the, in, the, in a few years. So I am, you know, very, very, very into that, very into different influences, like what which I think my influence is not just coming from music. Also, I think my influences are coming from everything, you know, from speaking to you, from everything. You know, I just learn everything, from movements, from whatever. So, yeah, I think that is what I am trying to keep, you know, like, living uh, my life in that way, you know, like, trying to learn as much as I can because my music is influenced by that. When somebody told me, how, what kind of music do you play? I always say I like play Cuban music. It's just like, it's different point of view. We, we live in a different, in a, you know, a different era. We are not, we are not living in the, in the 50s or, or centuries ago. So we live, you know, and we play how we live. So this is a moment uh, where technology is all about and where different influences we have different influences for different you know things that we didn't have in the in the 50s
That's Alfredo Rodriguez, and the track is Silence. More from our South African season with Mike Vitti. That's next Tuesday. Amongst others, we'll be talking to Patty Austin. And let me tell you, she can sometimes have a very low opinion of the record industry, and she can get quite grumpy too. And, of course, a lot of the other artists at the South African Jazz Festival. But things do get better as usual, because after the news, it's Helen Mayhew and Dinner Jazz.